tendon flexor transfers onto the cubital pedicle to get round the problem of reconstructing flexor tendons. Little by little, this new vision of anatomy began to throw light on the relationships between the tendons, the sliding sheaths and the vessels, and to challenge the very foundations of the classical school of thought. During the revascularization following the release of a garret, we observed that not only the tendinous extremities bled with an apparently circular longitudinal and peripheral vascularization, in contradiction with the avascular theory that held sway at that time, but that there seemed to be a real continuity between the sheaths and the tendons, which was not interrupted despite the distension occurring during sliding. It was also clear from observing the behavior of the vessels of the common carpal sheath during flexion and extension that rather simplistic mechanistic explanations could no longer account for these phenomena and that this apparent disorder and irregularity of shapes was in fact the basis of some other form of complexity that we still knew hardly anything about. In our attempts to find an explanation, we began detailed in vivo microscopic analysis of the distribution and mobility of the vessels using 25-fold video magnification. By looking at a vessel as a petrol pump, we were able to approach the problem more simply. There was this vertical structure looking like the main part of the pump, then the pipe, and finally the adjoining vessel, just like a car filling up at the gas station. The pipe seemed to move away as the car moved off and to fold up as it approached. Look at this sequence. A large vessel, vessel 3, is gradually moving behind vessel 2 and the pump during flexion, then goes past it while approaching vessel 1, which in fact is the car vessel, whose pump is slowly receding as the pipe extends to its maximum. Finally, Vessel 3 has overtaken Vessel 2 and has closed on Vessel 1, which itself has receded from Vessel 2. So several forms of speed and progression seem to exist in homogeneous living matter. Due to the influence of reductionist linear thinking, the only rational explanation used to be that vascular structures were reinforced by several coaxial layers of connective tissue, the closest to the tendon moving the fastest and the furthest away moving the slowest. However, that view of annular layers sliding together needed the existence of a hierarchical histological distribution to stand up to scrutiny. Yet in vivo observation made the notion unacceptable. This meant that we needed a new way of thinking, something posing the problem in terms of global dynamics, continuous matter a theory involving the concept of a tissue continuum in total contradiction with the traditional view of sliding structures. Briefly, the notion of stratification and virtual space. In vivo observation or with electron microscopy after dehydration showed that this collagen network in fact formed continuous matter composed of billions of tiny disorganized vacuoles apparently arranged in a fractal manner. It was pseudo-polygonal, but with a very special dynamic forming of volume of glycolicon, whose surrounding was composed of type 1, 3, 4 or 6 collagen fibers of considerably different sizes, according to their anatomical location and the role they had to perform. In this chaotic haphazard world, there was absolutely no geometric regularity, no linearity, just fractal chaos. This system is customarily known as the connective or aerial air tissue, but we called it the multimicrovacular collagenic absorbing system. To our minds, it was a rubbery elastic system because its role is to avoid reaching a threshold of resistance at which the collagen might shear. It has to allow the tendon to move freely without transferring the movement to the surrounding structures. It also struck us that the biomechanical behavior of this shock absorbing system could be accounted for by the theory of drawers. As the tendon moves, the first vacuole might undergo traction to a point where it triggers the adjoining vacuole into action. Then the third is triggered, and the fourth, to such an extent that the final vacuole remains almost inactive. Our second hypothesis was that the same process was involved, but that the pressure was distributed equally among the vacuoles. However, this meant we were still only in two dimensions and that our only explanation was based on linear processes. Yet we were sure of something. The tissue continuum, the existence of basic vacuolar type structures and the presence of a shock absorbing system allowing the organs to act independently. 
We had to move to three dimensions to really understand what was happening. And it was around that time that computer synthesized images came online. They made it possible to visualize structures as a system in perpetual motion with two rigid boundaries, a fixed external one and a fully mobile internal one. What we did was to introduce a cross-linking mesh type architecture which included the microvacuoles on the armature. We then looked for the fractal distribution. The scientific approach and the graphic model pointed to the same apparent reality. There really was a sliding system with brilliant liquid lying between the vacuoles and an armature of collagen fibers. This confirmed what we had initially thought about the pulling and tugging going on between the vacuoles. Moreover, thanks to this discovery, we were able to confirm that not only the tendons were able to move independently from each other, entire organs could do likewise, so the system was common to the whole organism. It was then that we realized what we had discovered. This multi-microvacular collagenic absorbing system was to be found everywhere in the body. This sliding tissue is to be found in every nook and cranny of our organism in other tendons, like the extensors, in the abdominal wall near the rectus abdominis muscle, in contact with the thorax near the latissimus dorsi muscle, in the retroconjunctival groove of the eye, and so on. Indeed, it would seem that this tissue serves to anchor the muscles and tendons, and could even be their primary constituent material. Even structures not called upon to move as such, nerves and the periosteum, are composed of this tissue fiber, but with differences in their arrangement and size. The mesoscopic framework of living matter required a more holistic view to be fully understood. So we began to look at the cutaneous and subcutaneous structures, which we thought we would find to be more stable in this mobile tissular environment. By its structure and its role of enclosing the other sensory organs, the skin is more than just an organ. It's a set of organs which is anatomically, physiologically, culturally and psychically complex. Of all the senses, touch is the most fundamental. You can survive without smelling, seeing or tasting, but not without touching. The skin permanently relays information. It never shuts down, blocks up or sleeps. It has an odor, a texture, it perspires, secretes, eliminates. It exchanges signals with the outside world. Thanks to the skin, the body's surface is as much a machine for communication as a protective barrier. It can change color, texture and shape and retains the vestiges of aggression, such as sunburn, scars, and disease. At birth, it is taught, ready for life. Then, little by little, it ages, gets wrinkled, folded, and sags. <laughs> 